Okay. Uh, this talk is going to be about converting uh, gray code representations and uh, long path problems and needle functions into a quadratic form. Um, just get this moving. Now, transforms have been used for 50 years uh, to convert, say, for example, SAT problems into max KSAT. And in fact, if you use a modern SAT solver, it's going to expect a max SAT form. And uh, those are usually K bounded or largely K bounded. For example, they could all be max three SAT. Uh, so transforms also serve as reductions to prove NP completeness, for example, in the case of max K SAT. So we can think of transforms as being quasi black box if you really care about black box optimization. That is, um, if I have a black box optimization function and all I know is that it has some polynomial form, uh, it, you need to tell me what the, the polynomial form is. For example, it could be multilinear, it could be a Walsh polynomial, it could be a Fourier tramp polynomial, but uh, we need to know what kind of polynomial it is. Then you can have a black box transform. You run your black box function through the transform and you get out another function, which seems to be black box. And then you do your optimization there. And what this transform does is it converts our problems into something that has a K bounded form. But if you convert it, say, into quadratic form, well, this is only quasi black box because when you take your function that's black box and pass it through this transform and out comes another function that is black box, which is quadratic, I can still recover the original. I can recover the quadratic form in n squared time. And that's really easy to see. Uh, the the multilinear form of any quadratic is trivially found in order n squared evaluations because it has the property that w0 is equal to f of the string of all zeros and w1 is equal to the string 0, 0, 001 minus w0. And so I recover that coefficient. And in that way, I can recover all of the coefficients for the quadratic in order n squared time. And what I get then is a multilinear form, but I, it's no longer black box. Okay, so we will assume that our function is written in multilinear form. Multilinear form simply means that I have a set of variables, uh, x of i or x of j is a variable. Uh, I, multi to, I multiply together some subset of variables here. And so this will yield a zero or one when I multiply those together. And then uh, I weight the result of that by some constant s, uh, c sub s. So s is a subset of variables that all get multiplied together. This is the weight. And then I simply sum over all of the uh, uh, subsets in order to construct my, my polylinear form function. And so an example of that would be the multilinear form for uh, leading ones. So to evaluate leading ones, well, if the first bit is a one, you get a point. If the first two bits are ones, you get a second point. If the first one, two, three bits are one, you get a third point. If one, two, three, four bits are one, you get a fourth point and so on. So here, this is zero because the first bit is zero. This is one because there's only one bit before I encounter the first zero. And this is five because there's one, two, three, four, five bits before I encounter the five, the uh, zero. So this is leading ones written in multilinear form. And that's the standard form you typically see this written in. What's interesting about this is that if I take the Fourier transform of this, the Walsh polynomial is exponential in size. So I can't use the Walsh polynomial to compute anything about leading ones in its standard form because the Walsh polynomial is exponential in size. So uh, I can write this either as a maximization problem or I can just put in a minus one here into the multilinear form and convert this into a minimization problem by subtracting from n. Uh, either one's fine. Now here's why transforms work. Uh, I am going to uh, set up an equation where I have x1 times x2 is equal to z if and only if these other terms hold. 
x1 times x2 minus x1 times z minus x2 times z plus 3 times z, uh, putting in the appropriate constants here, equals zero. If this is true, uh, then I have a way of constraining the relationship between x1 and x2 uh, such that it's equal to z. If it's not equal to z, then this term will evaluate to greater than zero, and I have a mechanism for building a, con a penalty constraint. So what I'm going to do is build a new evaluation function where I re replace x1 and x2 with z, but I require that x1 times x2 uh, be equal to z in order for th this to be zero. If it's not equal to z, then this is going to be greater than zero. So this becomes a penalty term. And p is the uh, weighting of that penalty term. And so I simply make that greater than the sum of all my weights. And now I know my penalty is large enough that if z is not equal to x1 and x2, there is a large penalty. So having this way of doing substitutions, I take my leading ones problem. Uh, in this case, I'm going to replace x1 and x2 with z1. And when I do that, I put in the penalty term that ensures that z1 equals x1, x2. When you're looking at penalties, a quick trick to use is that you look at this term, z1, that's the replacing variable. You look at this term, x1, x2, those are the variables being replaced. And those are respectively the largest and smallest coefficients in the penalty term. Now here, I still have something that's not in quadratic form, so I will replace z1 and x3 with z2. And now I get this second set of penalties. Again, the thing that is, that is a single variable, the new auxiliary variable is here. It's the largest. The variables being replaced are here. They have the smallest coefficient. And now this is in quadratic form. So this is leading ones written in quadratic form with penalty terms. In general, this is how you write leading ones. And uh, this is the generalized form for uh, the all, uh, this is the generalized form that looks at three variables at, at a time, one variable from the original leading ones, and this is the penalty term that's associated with that. This is the uh, contribution to the uh, regular evaluation function without the penalty. The thing to note here is that once this is written in quadratic form, the actual polynomial is linear in size. So the Walsh polynomial goes from being exponential to being linear, and now we can compute all sorts of things about the search space. So this is also trivial to solve with any number of methods. You can use local search with look ahead to solve this problem in order and time. It also has a variable interaction graph that looks like this. And uh, because this uh, interaction graph is linearized, uh, it can be solved by dy dynamic programming in order in time. So problems, once they're transformed into quadratic form, can be much easier to solve. In fact, leading ones turns out to be submodular once you do that conversion. It also doesn't matter what order you take the variables in, you get the same variable interaction graph for what's known as the hidden permutations version of leading ones, okay? So what else can we do? Well, let's think about a needle in a haystack problem. What happens if I have this needle in a haystack problem where I get 100 points if I land on the needle and I get zero everywhere else? Well, I write that in polynomial form. I take that, give it to someone, say, here's a black box with a needle function in it, run it through a transform and give me back the transform. Run it through the transform, you get back this black box. But remember I said, it's not really black box because I can retrieve the information in that black box knowing that it's quadratic. So after being transformed, the needle in a haystack problem, all needle in a haystack, needle in a haystack problems are trivial to solve in order in squared time. And one reason for that is because they, if you use exactly the same transform, it has exactly the same variable interaction graph as leading ones. And it's trivial to solve by any number of methods, including dynamic programming and also including local search with uh, look aheads. Now, uh, the other contribution in this paper is to say that uh, a lot of functions, when they are expressed in binary form, uh, can often be k-bounded. If you look at the original de Young test suite, 
these functions are k-bounded, which means we could compute all sorts of information about this. We can compute the Walsh uh, transforms of these functions. We can compute the eigenvectors of the search space. We can compute the location of proving moves in constant time. But what if instead of using a binary representation, we use a gray code representation? So um, if you want to use a gray code representation, this paper presents a constructive proof showing how gray code representations can also be expressed in quadratic form. So uh, what the paper basically gives you is a way of saying, oh, if you want to encode any function using gray codes, we can still convert it into quadratic form using the constructive proof that is presented in this paper. One other thing this paper does is it shows how other problems can be converted into quadratic form that might not seem to lend themselves to that. So here's uh, longest path problems. Longest path problems are actually long paths that are embedded in a larger search space. And uh, the long path basically is a gray code that is extends along the diagonal of the search space with what are known as bridge points. So you'll notice that along this diagonal, these bits change by one bit. And these are identical except linked through this bridge point. And so um, all of these points have a suffix or prefix here of zero, zero. All these points down here have a, a prefix of one, one. This point over here has a prefix of one, zero. So that's why going from here to here and here represents a single bit change because now it's in this prefix space. Uh, if you want to double the length of your long path, uh, well, first I want to point out that this is actually a gray code. Long path problems are gray codes. So the methods that we've introduced into this paper also apply to long path problems. You want to increase the length of your long uh, path problems. Well, since they're gray codes, you use the standard trick, which is used in gray codes, which is to simply reflect the path. So here is the problem uh, uh, before I extend it into a larger space. And now here is where I've extended it into, uh, embedded into a larger search space. Instead of adding one additional bit, we're adding two additional bits in this particular case. And long path problems have the property that the path does grow exponentially long because it doubles in length every time you add two more bits to the representation space. But it's actually uh, a uh, sort of a bridge or a ribbon that is uh, stretched out in a otherwise large empty space. Uh, long path problems have this secondary gradient over that large space that pulls you back to the origin of the path, which is up here in the, in, at the corner, okay? Now, to convert these long path problems into uh, uh, quadratic form, uh, I've introduced a number of auxiliary variables here because first we need to just write it in polynomial form. So uh, I take my original encoding and I re-encode it as a gray vector because in, in fact, it is a gray code. Then I take the binary form of that gray vector and we'll call that Z. So I have the G vector, which is the gray form and Z, which is the binary form. And then L, which is a leading bits vector. It tells me uh, how deeply embedded in the space the, uh, the long path problem is where I'm currently evaluating it. And then B tells me where the bridge points are. So given the vectors G, Z, L, and B, I can write a polynomial that evaluates the longest path, right? So this is just on the path itself. This is its evaluations. And then given that, I can write uh, a, a, an equation that says the long path problem is simply the long path portion, which I just, I just showed you, uh, can be expressed uh, using those vectors. Then the bridge points, which also can be expressed using those bridge points. And then this is a, uh, the opposite of one max. It's a zero max function that pulls all the other gradients in the space toward the string of all zeros. And then these can be written in quadratic form. So we have then a way of converting these long path problems into uh, quadratic form. 
if I look at this, this is in polynomial form. At this point, I could just pass this into any arbitrary transform and it will convert it into quadratic form. However, in this particular paper, I came up with a custom set of transforms just to make it more understandable to people what exactly is going on and exactly what the penalty functions are and what they look like. So questions, the main, uh, let me just summarize, the main contribution of this paper is that we show that all great encodings can be converted into a quadratic form easily. We looked at the needle in a haystack function and showed that it could be converted into quadratic form and then becomes trivial to solve. And we showed that problems such as long path problems can also be converted into quadratic form. All right, questions. <laughs>